Welcome to Business at the Speed of Coffee, the one show about business, by business, for business. Well, you couldn't have lived in New Zealand for the last 70 or 80 years without having known about Sir Robert Jones, affectionately known as Bob. Not he affectionately. Has stood astride, <laughs> he has stood astride New Zealand business, sport, recreation, culture and politics in a way as none other. And most recently, he's still writing another book. But today we're going to talk not just about Bob's illustrious life, but about things that we've seen developing in the area of buildings and real estate. Tremendous change, of course, has come from technology, change in immigration and culture. Are they for the better? What should we do about it? And what does the future hold? So, welcome Sir Robert Jones, Bob. Thank you, Kip. Thank you for being with us today. Now, let's talk a little bit about your beginning in property. I was lying, dying, literally, in hospital at 21. I knew I was dying. And then everything changed, you know, and the, the drugs worked. So I lay there and I thought, what am I going to do with my life? I didn't, couldn't, couldn't work out the answer after a few weeks. I, it took me a couple of years later to realise what the gap was, what the problem was, and that was that I couldn't abide working for anyone. Probably I would venture that at least half pe the people who are self-employed, and what is it, about 400,000 mm. people, something like that in New Zealand, uh, probably are earning bugger all. Mm. But it's a price they're happy to pay to be mm. self, their own master. And I felt that very strongly, but I didn't realise I was thinking that. I only worked out what the problem was. And then, well, what to do? Yeah. You know, I mean, I came from a working class family. My parents left school at 12, both of them. Not uncommon for their generation. And, but again, it wasn't hard. I thought, well, I'd better make money. I didn't know how to make money. And then having reached that decision, I thought, well, I'm going to make some effort to make some money. I should try and make a lot as quickly as possible because <laughs> I'm not really a businessman at heart. I find everything interesting, but that's not, yeah, it's well so down the peak order. And so I worked it out. It was very easy. I thought, sell something intangible, price of intangibles or whatever you say it is. And so I thought, if I sold something intangible and put a massive price on it, they'd think it's bloody good. To give you an analogy, if you walk past an art gallery, an art, you know, mm -hmm. and you say, God, that's a nice painting. I wonder how much it is. Mm -hmm. But you don't know. Are they going to say 500 or 50,000? You have no idea till you ask. Mm -hmm. So it's whatever you, you know. And so that worked. And suddenly, within two years, I was really quite rich. I think I might have been... Uh, one of the first pound millionaires. No, I went from one extreme to but another. Was it in property? No, no. It's, I, it, it, I've worked out if I sold advertising space. Ah. And I just ca came up with simple things that I invented myself. And I mean, the first thing I came up, I went to the library in Lower Hutt and then I went to bookshops. I said, look, I'll supply you bookmarks. We'll put the city coat of arms on the top of one half, I'll also advertise in the other. Well, they were delighted. So that's the history, and so I made so much. And um, I had to do something with it. And I bought oh, a building I okay. in the hut, a new building. I didn't know what I was doing. But the hut was extremely vibrant back then, much more so than Wellington, the centre of the hut. But you've been an investor more than a developer, right? Oh, yeah, I'm not a developer. We are building a building in Wellington now. I wanted the site. Okay. Also, and uh, I get very angry. It's not just New Zealand about commercial architecture. I'm looking here in Auckland today, the big new one, whatever they call it, the crisscross steel beams mm -hmm. across the windows up there. That's that not necessary. They'll say, oh, it's an architectural, the earthquake engineering. You don't have to do that. That never occurs to them. Well, what about the poor bugger sitting behind this? I'll give you a good example. The BBC television, which is a terrible channel now, uh, always had as this sort of logo when they came on a shot of Big Ben. Yes. <laughs> and that's gone in recent years. And the, the, the what's the name building? The Pickle. The Pickle one. Another one. <laughs> that is the symbol now. It's shocking bad design. I've been in offices there. Their windows all crisscrossed with steel. Why? But people say, oh, isn't that great? You know, no, it's not great. Some architects copied the bloody thing in Barcelona. And it's disastrous. Christchurch, God, we walked through there. It used to be such a wonderful mm. city. 
just such a delightful city. Still, they, with, until they started allowing supermarkets, big shopping centres in the suburbs, took the shops out, and it started to die well before the earthquake. Mm. Oh God, the rubbish that's been built there now. They should be flogged. They really should, commercial architects. Uh, they, I'll tell you something yeah. about them. This says everything about them. I have noticed the very high incident of commercial architects' wives racing off with the first bloody stop-go sign holder, truck driver, anything going past. They've got a very high incident. It's very explicable. <laughs> <laughs> now, if you were to describe any buildings that you really like around Auckland, are there any? Yes, there's one. We own it. <laughs> But it is a beautiful building, and that's the, uh, what are we, what's it called? It's SAP House in Queen Street. The Faye Richwhite building, all uh, credit. Yeah. But no, they brought an Italian architect in. Okay. And it's the only building that we've ever bought uh, in the last 20 years, and we've probably bought about 30 office buildings here and overseas, that um, we haven't had to spend literally millions on mm. tidying up design mistakes. Oh, really? It's shocking. I mean, I could explain some of them, but, you know, there'd be better things than that. But, no, that building is good. And I actually asked Greg, the uh, New Zealand manager once, I said, look, you know, we love our buildings, so we care what they look like. Mm -hmm. Our buildings are always clean and polished and all that sort of thing, regardless of cost. Um, and uh, do you think anyone notices tenants in that? You know, obviously they notice the foyer and the lifts and the th their own space that we're offering them and that sort of thing. He said, no, they don't. We do. We just obsess. But the one exception, he said, that building, people want to be in it. It's, you know, it, it is golden. <laughs> the the, the colour's gold. It's a beautiful building. Um, do you manage your own properties? Or of do you use company do. manager? You do. have about 50 okay. staff around the world. Yeah. Okay. So you do your own, you don't have management contracts? No. <laughs> God, no. <Okay. laughs> um, no we, have, we have armies of people in our office. I, look, I'm retired, but I... Uh, I mean, I, I get a lot of mail, I do a lot of writing, mm. and I handwrite everything. So this creates a problem, a modern problem, finding a girl that can still type. <laughs> I've got to go and to get... So I go and two or three times a week here to get my typing done. And um, then I'll stay on and anything interesting happening, I hear about it. And We're the biggest owners in the CBD of Wellington. We have 18 buildings. In Wellington? And, in yeah, Sydney still? Hmm? Do you still have property in Sydney? Yes, we have property here. It's, the city I, we're going in, we've been going in big in recent years has been uh, Glasgow. Now, the imagery of Glasgow, of course, is drunken Irishman mm. and that, but those days are well gone. It's now uh, five universities, a major academic centre, a major tech city. It's Scotland's it's third biggest city in Britain. Mm. The real population of Glasgow is nearly two million. Why do I love it? I've got a home there, actually, nearly 200 years old, but all modern. I, you, you walk down that city, and when you're passionate about buildings, as I am, the variety, you can sit outdoors in a coffee shop anywhere and just cast your eyes up and down the street. Here's a Georgian one. As but, an investor mm -hmm. in Scotland, how does it compare to investing, say, in Sydney or New Zealand in terms the of the The rules of our business are the same everywhere. OK. Whether it's Moscow or Shanghai or anywhere, the same rules apply uh, uh, everywhere. And the same dumb things can be seen everywhere. We're coming into a boom acquisition period because the world's about to go into a 30s depression. It's being smothered at the moment. Mm. I'll give you an idea. Wellington is an administrative city. So even in economic downturns, you get pretty much full employment. And I mean, all our office buildings are full in Wellington. We actually got people asking us, what about the new one? Can we? But there's a bit of explaining to be done on that. Now, to employ someone to do a menial job like answering the phone, a front desk person, it can be pretty hard finding somebody. And they advertised. We had 220 applicants wow. two weeks ago. Now, if you get 220 applicants, that tells you the degree of which the money printing has smothered the reality. And covering, so, up, covering things up. Yes. We're going to see mass unemployment. And, you know, what was last year's fashion? Last year's was just children marching in the street about global warming. Mm. I don't make light of global warming. It's a reality mm. and a serious concern but I don't want to be lectured by children. Mm. And this year's, um, what have they been marching about this year? Oh, yes, Black Lives Matter. <laughs> yes, over 100 came out in Nelson chanting Black Lives Matter. Many blacks to be found in Nelson? Any? <laughs> Any at all? <laughs> I mean, yeah, this is fashionable behaviour. Yeah. 
Black Lives Matters, uh, matters has gone by the way now. Nobody mm. gives a damn. That's, that's, next year it'll be the unemployment marches. Mm. Then the year after will be the anti-rich marches, this sort of thing. They're pretty predictable. What about your buildings? So there's predicting the end of the office building. Oh. <laughs> Have a look. I mean, I've been, enjoyed this. Have a look who writes them. Journalists write them. Yeah. I'll give you the example to explain why you should ridicule that. In the 1980s, house mortgage rates rose quite dramatically. By 1983, they hit 24%. People paid them. Uh, believe it or not, 24% to get a mortgage for your house. Well, there you go. <laughs> it sort of was economic we because no the, 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 the bloody inflation was such that it was doubling up every, yeah. you know, this sort of thing. But you'd still rather pay 2.5% today, which yeah. is historically unprecedented. And it's going to stay for a while. Now, but that's another issue. Um, you still rather that. It makes life a bit easier. But nevertheless, they were. And, of course, this, that was probably the heyday decade for newspapers. I love newspapers, yeah. so I know a bit about the history of newspapers and that. And that probably was the epitome of newspaper readership worldwide. Then things in the course of the technology has now killed them. Most newspapers of print media have died everywhere and the rest are hanging on in, but they're dying. And so everyone read newspapers and every time the mortgage rate went up, right through the 80s, there was the same heading, homeowners punished. And you'll remember that. I know you were a schoolboy in shorts back then in the 80s, but you'll remember that. Now, homeowners punished again. 30% of New Zealanders had a mortgage in the 80s. 70% yeah. didn't have a mortgage. Mm. The journalists wrote stories through their eyes. Mm. Now, we've had all this cock about, uh, oh, working from home, blah, blah, blah. They, they think of office space in terms of their, their own experience, namely being crammed into a room together. That's not your normal office scenario. They're not normally like that. We've got demand exceeding supply money. Really? Absolutely. We're a full house in Scotland. This lockdown, has it caused rent to be behind in your buildings? Uh, no, we haven't had much problem. That's, there's one amusing aspect. Um, because we own so many buildings in prime locations, we also have a lot of retailers and we're very pickety about who goes in. I mean, banks are giving up on the shop fronts now, that's, you know, development, but we would not let a bank in. We would rather let some young girl and give her six months free to help us start, uh. start a dress shop. Dress shops are had it now, though. Why? Because dress shops are so gay and colourful and all that, it makes for good, you know, mm. it, it, it helps present the bird. We're very careful who we let go into our shops. The next best thing, because they're all, there's hardly any dress shops now, they're not viable anymore. Girls just buy stuff online mm. so cheaply. Uh, but the next best thing to make a building attractive is a cafe that, that spreads outside, you know, the entrance. People like walking past people, people, uh, you know, whining and dining and all that sort of thing. Um, and so we've got an awful lot of those. We've, we've got the most shops in the CBD and money, not that we particularly want to, and also the most floor space because we also own the David Jones store. Not that we oh, particularly really? want to either, but it <laughs> went with two office towers we, we wanted. Um, so we know a bit about the retail thing, but you know, we just help them along um, as and when is required. You know, we, you know, our people know them and we felt for them. We didn't wait to be asked. We told them to stop paying rent when they started the lockdown. I got pretty angry with Andrew Little, the Justice Minister, mm. when he'd come out with this nonsense he came up with, you know, and I sent him a real rocket. I said, why didn't you talk to me before you come out with this nonsense? You know, I've known him for years. Mm. And anyway, he rang and apologised, and we went out to dinner. And it was very nice. He, to re he said, well, what would you know about it? You know, everybody knows your company's reputation. Which is? And that had followed with a similar thing had been said a month earlier by the American ambassador to me. Ambassador, he said, God, your company's got a great reputation. I said, you've been talking to the other ambassadors, because <laughs> yeah. we've got about 20 of them as tenants. Right. And they all tell them, make sure they're in one of our buildings. And... Uh, he said, no, no, no. He said, if your name comes up, everybody says it. Well, we're very proud of it. We employ a lot of people. We do a lot of things that are very unusual, that are not done anywhere else in the world. For example, we would be the biggest buyer of art, I would think, in the world. We buy, on average, probably about six to ten paintings a week. A week? Yep. 
from dealers all over New Zealand, painters directly. Where do they go? They go into our tenancies. We won't let them have one for the foyer. We want them to line their walls. We make it a home away from home. Uh, right now, due here very shortly on the water, are about 400 Persian rugs. We employ staff that are solely concerned with that sort of thing. We will have, say, 20 paintings arrive and the tenant will come in. Our chaps will... Our, we, we have an odds bob man. They go and hang them. We make suggestions. We turn their offices into my office as a model, albeit I don't go in there very much, but I have a huge office. When you grow up in a little state house, <laughs> you get very mindful of space. And there's, yeah, we must have millions of dollars of art in our Wellington office, but, uh, but it's not just name artists or anything. We're not interested in that. Um, it's you know, just making the environment so who good. Who curates all this? Somebody must keep track of it all. Of course. Uh, they just took on a, a, a young lass uh, this week, actually. A pretty girl, actually. I, actually, I have her <laughs> brains and abilities match her looks. But her job is solely as a record keeper of all this stuff. But you know, don't the other staff do that. It's a pretty big exercise. But no one ever leaves us. And the cost of a, you know, of a tenant leaves... Look, I'll tell you how it works with commercial real estate. It's easy to find out, and commercial agents find out the leasing situation in every building, and it's, it's a competitive market. Yeah. And they go around nine months before a lease runs out and say, let me show you other space. Mm -hmm. And two of Colliers, they're the biggest uh, um, commercial agent mm -hmm. active in Wellington at the moment, uh, two of their agents had to shift because of us and do stuff at the back of town. We're only interested in the prime CBD because we can't shift our tenants. Our tenants never leave. If you go and look in the foyers of our buildings, you'll get, get an idea of the wonderful paintings everywhere, all sorts of things. Then the next one of the carpets, the first batch of 400, are due here. The girls will go around and get the handyman that we employ to bring in sort of half a dozen. But we don't want them to put one in there for you. We want one in every room. It's so good economics. Nice. They have a look. Mm. And when they come to work, and then next year, I'd like to do it myself, but I could... Well, I couldn't. I don't even have a cell phone. I wouldn't know how to work one, but I'm the only bugger in the world not to have a cell phone. I don't want one. Um, but it could be done online, but I actually would rather go out and talk to them in mm. Thailand. We will organise um, massive quantities of porcelain, bowls, uh, yeah, all sorts of things. For your buildings? Yeah, and then the girls will take them around. You know, how, this would look nice there in the foyer on this thing, and that, along with magazines. I mean... As I've said twice, I'll say it again, the economics from our point of view are outstanding. I'm not going to explain why, but they are. It works. The cost of a tenant leaving is great. We, our tenants never leave. Why would they? There's to go to an empty here. space and give up all this wonderful ambience. You spend most of your meaningful day, your working life, if you like, in an office, assuming you're an office worker, yeah. that is, and... Why not? You go into it, the average office. There's nothing on the walls. Yeah, and they're boring. They're boring. Yeah, yeah. You're running know. a business. You've got your employees. Yeah. Do you want them all strewed at home? Of course not. A little bit of homework is OK, but not the whole business. Um, I'd nothing like to... ever stopped them working from home before. <laughs> no. It's hardly innovative. <laughs> so I... why do it's so great? Yeah. Look, you'll get some computer companies will do it because yeah. they're pretty bloody dim. Yeah. computer companies in our experience. Aside from that, we, we, we try not to let them in our buildings because they lower the tone in the lips. You know, <laughs> they do. You know, they, they don't do. dress very well. <laughs> no, well, I'm serious. This is all part of the service we do. We would never let, say, a call centre in mm. because they have scruffs and people don't want to be in the lifts with them. Uh, you mentioned hiring young people and I know you're on record of encouraging liberal arts education. Now, if you look at our education system today, would you like to comment a bit how we're streaming kids? It's what happens in the modern world of necessity. Kids are asked to make a decision about their career when they're 17. And they're not... And they've got no idea. No they? idea, really. Yeah. Thus, they used to go and say journalism. That sounded exciting. Mm. And by the time they've woken up to the realities at 35, mm. that's what made them a bit aggressive about successful yeah. people. Yeah. I mean, suddenly, oh, they've cracked it. They're in the press gallery now. Mm -hmm. and they're running along beside the ministerial car. There's Bill Bloggs in the back. It was the dunce at school, and he's a cabinet minister. Yeah. Oh, a minister, <laughs> a word minister. <laughs> yeah. And, of course, it makes them a bit militant. Yeah. Another one would be architecture. You can imagine why a 17-year-old would think that's exciting. 
and be sitting there poring over books or the Sydney Opera House and buildings of that nature. What's the reality at 35? Designing an Somebody's extension done to the somewhere. kitchen window yeah. <laughs> and they're complaining about the cost. <laughs> That's the reality. No wonder they to go, mm. you know, go berserk and get this. But you could also say that about a lot. I mean, I've got a very good friend who's a top medical specialist and he hates it. And he's desperate to get out. Um, it's, it's boring. It's repetitious what he does all day, every day. Sort of. And he's, he's, you know, I don't know what the answer is. In an ideal world, if we could afford it, everyone would do a liberal arts degree, history being the foremost subject. Mm. And by the time they're 22, would have a better idea. And perhaps we'll have that. I do have an answer, actually, but that's going to... I've talked to Waikato about it. They want to do it at the university. I said I'd pay for a chair, but I've changed my mind about whether that's the... What should be done at secondary school. But that's another thing altogether, where they all do a course in the particular Greek philosopher. Um, it is election time, 2020. Uh, if you were to be coming in to run in the country... If, what, I, if running you were country, now becoming Prime I'd Minister, would what would be, you do? I would get all the commercial... Well, it depends. Forget about elections. Let's say I took, had a military coup, all right? <laughs> that's so more likely, right? That's better, yeah. Much better, happier situation. <laughs> so I could do what I bloody well like. The first thing, down Lambton Quay, I would erect about 20, would be enough, gallows. And I'd hang about 20 major culprits of commercial architects in Wellington. Okay. And I'd leave their corpses there like they used to do in the 17th yeah. century in Britain to rot. <laughs> and before they were hanged, of course, they'd get a thousand lashes. And we'd leave them there hanging as an example <laughs> to the other. So I think that'd be the most important thing I'd do first, okay. most necessary. But example. there have to be some other things, surely. Oh, there'd be other things, yes. But the order of pecking order, well, that's obviously the most important. <laughs> I'm not an architect. <laughs> OK, <laughs> who's next? I'm not knocking architects. <laughs> I'm not in a position to. I'm knocking commercial building architects. Okay, okay, They're a okay, disgrace. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I'll just give you a couple of examples that the public can understand. I was having them on once. Now, I do have rather large, glamorous offices. I said, look at this. Look at the splendid view I've got. And what's... Look at this. This bloody great column in the middle of it. And the senior part of 93 architects firm said, well, what's wrong with that? Oh, God. Uh, it's not necessary. <laughs> this is the engineering aspect, you see. It's not necessary to do that. Uh, they do think they put the lifts in the wrong place. You take downtown Sydney. I mean, I, you know, I'd, I'd, you'd be hard-pressed to get me to knock Australia because it's always been very good to me. I've spent a lot of time there. I've had a home there for 50 or 60 years. Never go there much now. But um, it just dismays me to walk around downtown Sydney now. It's just... She sheer glass walls everywhere, mm. going up everywhere, 80 storeys. Used to be such a picturesque city. Before that's we why I love Glasgow. It's marvellous, the variety of architecture. Modern as well. Before we the finish, Bob, uh, you, have a, you have a large family. And are you optimistic for the future that they see in New Zealand? Well, the certain answer to that that you have to have by logic, you have to be optimistic about the future. Um, logically, you should be. If, if, there are plenty of reasons to be terribly pessimistic. Mm. The one thing that I am fairly sure about, we won't have a world war now. The best thing is, I mean, I am extremely anti-militant and you know, I can't stand armies. I love what's going on in Azerbaijan and Armenia right now. They're killing one another. <laughs> I love that. Soldiers are killing one another. What soldiers mostly do are point guns at citizens. Yeah. That's the cold, hard reality. So the best thing ever happened to the world was probably Hiroshima. The Nagasaki was a bit <laughs> rich adding that. But, no, I'll tell you why. Take the First World War. Uh, people going up the street with young men, giving them a white feather. You know, mm. off you go, you know, this sort of thing. No white feathering anymore. After the, that, and also the mass bombing, uh, particularly of German cities, mm. but also some British cities in London and that, suddenly it's the citizen in the front line. Mm. So suddenly there's peace movements everywhere. Because, uh, and uh, that's, so th that's, the, that's why there's no winners from nuclear things. You can't win that. That is a topic for another day. Yes. There are two big topics right now, COVID-19 and the elections. First one, who's going to win the elections? Oh, it's pretty obvious that Labor are going to poll. Um, they may even get 50%. I suspect they won't. 
mm. but it's fairly obvious with the Jacinda mania, <laughs> that sort of thing, which is rather silly, but it's the reality. And so there won't be a change of government. I think we can be yeah. safely assured of that. Um, COVID-19. What do you... How long do you think well, it's going to take us to the climb problem down? Was that when this thing first happened, and we're reading about it in China, and boom, bang, it was all yeah. so sudden. We were dealing in the dark. But I wrote a piece about it, got a hell of a reaction. I said, when it's all done and dusted, I have a feeling, and of course I might be wrong, but I have a feeling that we will say Sweden got it right. Now, this is not a day goes by. Yesterday's Australian Financial Review, the editor, wrote a thing, they got it right. We see this stuff in the British press, serious press, all the time, because they got it right. Uh, they compare their figures, now compare their figures, uh, with the way they approached, was, for example, Finland yesterday. Mm. Mass outbreak in Finland, a highly civilised country, Finland, you know, we're not talking... So we're still in the dark a lot about it, but we know who it kills. It kills old people. Mm. What are you pointing a finger at people? <laughs> 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 old people with pre... pre use the terminology, pre-existing mm. conditions. And unlucky buggers, and mm. fat buggers. Mm. Well, that, the world's a better place without them. <laughs> uh, no, obese fat people. Yeah, yeah. Um, and that's why Britain took a fair... And the US. But, and the yeah. States, of course, yeah, yeah. 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 But, you know, it sounds a bit callous when you talk about it uh, and who it kills, but they don't have to be die of it if they you know, want to protect themselves. I think history will record that we probably got it wrong. Having said that... As I say, I, I said that's when it started dusted, I suspect. But if I had been in the Prime Minister's thing, of course you'd kick the touch. Mm. Of course you'd do the lockdowns, you'd mm. do all that. They're all quite understandable. But it does appear now, after nine months, that it wasn't the way to go. It's cost a lot of money. Yeah, well, of course, anyone that raised that was always, oh, money over lives and that, but that's cock. Mm. Um, the other thing is now we're seeing some literal figures. For example, some came out from Britain. The number of avoidable deaths through operations not taking place, mm. cancer patients not getting their treatment, this mm. sort of thing. And a lot more deaths than have died from the virus. And there may well be other people dying from depression and other things. Well, that. that's always a certainty. And we saw mm. some terrible dishonesty, in my view, when, and it was rather ironic too, when about a, six weeks ago, the chief coroner, a woman, a judge, came out and said, oh, all this business about people being depressed and committing suicide is rubbish. Here's the latest figures. Well, come on. She produced them. They're almost identical to the previous year. The year being to the 30th of June. Yeah. They don't declare a lockdown. Everybody who <laughs> gets depressed overnight and commits suicide it takes a bit of time. But the irony was that the Dominion Post, Wellington's newspaper, published that story, her story, her claim, alongside another one, you know, massive spike in Hawke's Bay suicides. Mm. Hers went to the 30th of June. The thing had only been going a couple of months. Yeah. You, of course, Stupid we know numbers. that every economic depression is all over the world, no exceptions, causes a lot of suicides. Well, this one, yeah. This and is going to be a doozy. We're reading about them all yeah. the time. We're one or two... Yeah, there's a bit of a human interest story with them and that. It's pretty much a regular thing. But, well, why? Yeah, of course the suicide rate's going like that. Mm. She's going... When next year's figures come out, she's going to have made a bloody fool of herself mm. when she did saying that in the first place. But before we close, Bob's written another book. It's for sale. It's called Four Comic Novellas, full of thoughts and wisdoms. Perhaps a Christmas present for the rest of the family. I didn't ask for that to be promoted. <laughs> I brought copy up for a here. But never miss a commercial moment, Bob. Well, so, uh, <laughs> thank you for being on Business at the Speed of Coffee.